Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to IndyCar. My name is Gordon Ross, and today's show uh, is looking at the response of the Russians to the, the demonization that's being uh, attempted by both the British government, the Americans, and a lot of Western mm -hmm. Europe. The demonization of Russia has been going on actually for the last couple of years, rather unsuccessfully by, by the British state initially, um, in their attempts to try and make us fear the so-called Russian bear and its uh, aggressiveness, as they put it. The business with the Skripkal murder, or the attempted murder of the, the father and son uh, Skripkal family in Salisbury, seems to have acted as a catalyst for this hysterical um, overreaction by the West. It's perhaps re worth remembering that sometimes a single event can spark off a war. They remember that the First World War was, was started by a successful assassination of, of Fr the Duke Franz Ferdinand uh, before World War I broke out. So it is entirely possible that uh, an assassination attempt, even a failed one, can spark a war, can spark a conflict quite easily. Russian politicians are today uh, quoted as saying, that they feel that the, um, the demonization of Russia and the, the massive withdrawal of diplomats by both the United States, who withdrew 60 of their diplomats from their Moscow um, embassy, and I think something like 20 other European nations have also done similar things, withdrawing diplomats from Russia, is seen as an escalation in this a drip feed that's been going on of the toxicity trying to make Russia seem like a threat to, to Western Europe. Russian politicians, and I'm not talking here about Vladimir Putin incidentally, I'm talking about opposition politicians to Vladimir Putin. Their opinion is interesting because they say that this is the West trying to distract attention of their own populace away from the fact that the Western economy is failing, it's about to collapse. The European Union is beginning to wobble, it's beginning to fall apart. And because Europe, as they put it, no longer fears um, an Islamic invasion because so many uh, refugees from Syria and other places in war-torn Middle East are now living in Europe, that Europe has lost its fear of Arab states. So they no longer have Islamists as the enemy that everybody has to hate. So in the absence of a really good enemy to hate, it seems that both Britain and the United States and Western Europe now see Russia as the easy go-to target to demonize, to pr produce some kind of enemy for people to fear, so that that will consolidate people's feelings uh, and make them want to act together. In other words, to pull the nations of the European Union mm -hmm. together so that things like defence spending goes up, so that they start to re-equip, so that they can encircle Russia even further with more weaponry. Remember that um, in the last three or four years, since uh, Russia took part in the Syrian conflict, taking the side of Bashar al-Assad, the Syrians decided, uh, the Syrian government asked the Russians for help to put down the rebellion and to get rid of the Islamic militants in their country. Now, in theory, whatever you've heard about uh, Bashar al-Assad, we've only ever heard it from our own government and our own media that he's the bad egg that everybody says he is. But remember that Bashar al-Assad was educated in the finest universities in England before going back to Syria to take his place as the leader of the country. He's not a stupid man. I don't think, and this is only my opinion, I don't think he's the kind of man who would unleash chemical weapons, but it's quite possible that somebody has been using chemical weapons in Syria. However, the point is that when Russia got involved in the Syrian conflict, it threw a spanner in the works for both America and the UK and Europe, who were also meddling in the Middle East at that time, trying to bring Bashar al-Assad down, so that they could drive pipelines through his country to get oil from other parts of, um, of the Middle East into Turkey and into Europe. So this geopolitical manoeuvring is really all about oil and money, and the European Union and the West uh, were seen as as trying to do this instead of actually stopping the rebellion in Syria and stabilising that government, they tried to destabilise it. Which set them on a course 
against the Russian Federation. The Russians actually acted within their UN mandate. They were asked for help by another country and they provided it. And they have largely succeeded in putting down the rebellion and they certainly got rid of the Islamic State. In fact, they now believe that they've cleared them completely from Syria, very successfully and far more successfully than the West claims. So looking at this from the other side of the fence, if you like, from the Russians' viewpoint, they feel now that they are being turned into the bad guy that they're being used as a way of pulling Western Europe together after Britain bailed out and has left the whole of Europe in a state of panic and frenzy. So it's interesting to see this from the other side. And this is, this is news that is coming from Russia itself. It's coming from not Putin, but from his opposition parties. The ones who oppose Putin are saying this. So we're not talking about Putin as the big buddy and he's saying this, we're talking about his enemies saying this about the West. And I think there's something to this. I think the geopolitics of the Middle East have set Russia and Europe against one another. The Europeans have been trying to lure Ukraine into the EU for years. The Russians annexed it to prevent the EU from poaching away a very large portion of what used to be part of the Soviet Union and was a critical sea base at Sevastopol in the Crimea. So a lot of a lot of pulling and pushing going on between Europe and Russia. So it's not just about Russia being the bad guy here, it's about Europe trying to take over parts of what used to be Russia. Taking away the uh, export markets for Russian goods that enter the Ukraine and, and other former Eastern, um, Eastern Bloc countries which were under Russian control. So there's a lot of pushing and pulling going on. It's very much more complicated than we're led to believe. Anyway, the point of all this is that it is perfectly feasible that the West is doing this on purpose to try and make us forget the fact that the European Union is wobbling and teetering at the moment on the, on the brink of falling to bits. While they try to pull that together, Britain's leaving. Britain's on the brink of falling to bits because it's, uh, it's forcing issues in Northern Ireland and Scotland to come to a head as well. So Britain wants to distract everybody from that by demonising Russia and giving us all somebody to hate. The Americans, well, who knows what the Americans think, but Trump obviously wants to distract people's attention from the fact that he's blundering along every day, um, basically telling at least, I think somebody counted up, about 5.9 complete lies every single day of the week, or contradictions every single day of the week. Anyway, that's, uh, that's looking at things from the other end of the telescope, from the Russian angle. That brings me to something uh, a little bit more positive. And it came to light, uh, strangely enough, in a newspaper which everybody in the independence movement tends to despise. It's, that's the Scotsman, the English newspaper with the Scottish name. The Scotsman ran a great story about uh, a new sports car manufacturer which is opening up in, uh, I, think it's, I think it's in Lothian, but I'll check exactly where. And the company is called uh, Raptor Sports Cars. Initially, they grew from a small... Uh, workshop company who produced high spec uh, race engines, basically uh, extremely powerful petrol engines for racing cars and for kit cars. But the demand for their engines was so great uh, that people started asking them if they had a car or a chassis. So they started to produce kit cars and it wasn't long before people were saying, well, why don't you just build cars and sell them to us as complete uh, units? So they're now expanding into their first ever production line and these cars are going to be available to buy. Now they're not, uh, they're not sort of like your average uh, five-door hatchback. These are two-seater, open cockpit, uh, race-style cars, uh, a little bit like the um, the Lotus Sevens that that came out in the 60s. These are these are open-top racing cars with a four-cylinder engine, open wheels, roll cages. No, no roof, no windows, basically just a very fast open top sports car that can be used either on the road or on track days just for fun or for racing. And these have become very successful and the kit car market in, uh, in the UK has actually become very large. But now this Scottish company is doing so well it's selling overseas and it has a distributor in Florida. So it was nice to hear for the first time since the 1970s that there is an indigenous Scottish car manufacturer set up in Scotland and it's expanding and it's producing cars now on a regular basis. It's going to be producing two models. Uh, one is the Raptor itself which is, is 
as I say, effectively it looks a little bit like a Lotus 7, and there are a lot of cars similarly styled. Uh, and another car, which uh, the name of which I can't remember, but which is styled after the AC Cobra, which is a very iconic American sports car. Uh, so they have a full body body shell for this. Race engines or road engines, you can choose for yourself all sorts of different levels. And these are cars which they are not cheap. And the people who can afford to buy these tend to be car enthusiasts who like to go for track days, maybe got a little bit of extra money, and they do this as a hobby. They're not supercars. These are stripped out performance cars. There's, not, there's no electric windows, there's no air conditioning, <laughs> there's no parking sensors. These are purely fast cars. And uh, people who buy these can actually have them built to custom order. In other words, they can specify the engine, the color, the style, the seats. Everything can be customized uh, to, their, to their own specifications. Anyway, I just thought it was worth uh, pointing out that this is a Scottish success story, and this is precisely the kind of startup and expansion that the Scottish uh, economy is needing. So I, I wish them well. I think uh, Raptor Sports Cars is a big success story, and I can see it doing really well because there's a big market for these types of sports cars all over the world, particularly in North America, and I think they will do really well exporting these things over there. I've had a little chat with their uh, with one of the directors, Jim, uh, just to wish him well and to say congratulations. I'd asked him if he had thought about perhaps doing a, a performance electric sports car. And that was an interesting conversation. He had actually been considering this idea, and it's something which I have long uh, been an exponent of, that Scotland should be one of the, the world leaders in producing new high-performance electric cars. It would be nice to think that Raptor might actually uh, take up the cudgels and have a go at developing a, an electric sports car, something fast, something high performance, not puttering about at low speed like a milk float, but something uh, with a, a speed of, you know, top speed 150 miles an hour and a not to 60 in 2.8 seconds. And all of these things are possible with high performance electrics. So I'll be interested to see how all of that works out. In the meantime, IndyCar is uh, back on the road doing, doing my usual thing this week. Um, those of you who watched the recent shows will know that I got a bit angry recently about the lack of television coverage um, of the Hands Off Air Parliament um, event in Edinburgh on Friday. And I think everybody who took part in that particular event, and also those who had never participated in an event before, can now see just how bad the, the media is in Scotland particularly. I'm talking about STV and the BBC and how they they just will not cover anything that has the slightest hint of either devolution or independence as part of the story. Anything which makes devolution look good or positive in any way is not reported. Anything which mentions independence in a positive light, not reported. It's not even as if they're trying to achieve a balance. They're just not trying to achieve anything at all. They're just trying to shut it out. I was pointing out to somebody recently, we were talking about what's happening in Catalonia this week, and the Catalan government has now shut the roads into and out of uh, Catalonia. They've, they've put down roadblocks to keep people from moving in and out of the, the area. They've been sending snatch squads of riot cops into the streets to break up any, any group of people more than six and chase them and beat them and arrest them, no matter what they're doing, whether they're protesting or not. The Spanish riot police have been going into bars and telling people to go home. They won't even let people go for a drink in peace. It's got that bad. And I was saying to somebody the other day when we were complaining about the media in Scotland being biased, I said, well, in Spain, they shut down social media completely. They turned off the cell phone network at one point uh, just before the referendum took place because they didn't want anybody to see what they were doing to the people on the streets. Luckily, a few people did manage to smuggle uh, photographs out, even though they weren't always live. They were smuggled out on phones, and then later on, once they were away from Barcelona or wherever, they could send them to social media. But the point is that you can't really hide brutality anymore in the digital age, no matter whether you switch off the media or not. And you cannot hide 5,000 people outside an Edinburgh Parliament without it sneaking onto social media. The BBC and STV are going to have to just remember that people like me 
and people like Bella Caledonia, people like Independence Live, people like uh, Wings Over Scotland, we're not going to let these events go uncovered. We're not going to let them go unannounced um, or uncommented upon. We will always make sure that you know about them. So it doesn't matter what the BBC omits. It doesn't matter what STV tries to cover up. It doesn't matter how many dead horses' heads they manage to throw into burns or how many minor road accidents take precedence over a gigantic uh, constitutional uh, demonstration in our, in our city, in our capital city. It doesn't matter what they do to distract us away from it or to shut it down. It will escape. It will get out. It's like trying to it's like trying to, to press down on an airbed. Somewhere along the line it pops up again somewhere else. Doesn't matter how many times they try to, to shut it down, it will pop up somewhere else. And it will always pop up on social media and I'll always be there to make sure that you know about it. And until independence is fully obtained by this country, I will keep doing this show and I will keep mentioning these pieces of information. Today I've tried to bring you the news from a Russian viewpoint to show you the way that ordinary people in Russia are looking at us at the moment. We are a shower of idiots letting people like the Tories and Donald Trump tell us that Russia is some kind of big enemy. The Russians are not. Whether you like Putin or not, remember that the story I was telling you today did not come from Putin or even his party. It came from the opposition, the people who oppose him think that Europe and America and the United Kingdom are deliberately demonising their country to drag your attention and mine away from the collapse of our own economy and our own unions over here. Remember, we all gloated when the Berlin Wall came down and the Soviet Union collapsed. How do you think the Russians will feel when the European Union collapses or the, uh, the United States of America's economy collapses? Big economies big unions and big empires eventually fail and when they do the fallout is catastrophic and it goes in all directions. I was making a point yesterday in the post uh, with a letter, an open letter which I had addressed to the, the people of China saying come and help us to develop a media so that we can have a chance of winning our independence so that we can be a normal country again and we will trade with China happily and openly. You know, we'll, we'll let you invest in our industries, we will sell our goods to you, we'll help produce products that China needs, and we can trade happily together. We don't see you as an enemy. Uh, and people say to me, oh, no, you can't trust China, you know, the Chinese are this, the Chinese are that. No, they're not. The Chinese are just a, a country which is coming out of a long period of, of very heavy communist repression, and they're working out how to trade with the capitalist world. And what happens as a result of that is going to shape the world economy. What happened yesterday was for the first time, China started to sell oil futures in Yuan, in their own currency for the first time. This is something that the Americans have desperately tried to stop them from doing because it undermines the petroleum dollar, the value of oil which is always priced in dollars and which has helped to prop up the American currency for decades. China now has huge oil fields and it has the ability to sell their oil on the open market. The Americans don't like it and I'll bet you any money that the Arabian nations hate it as well. But the point is China is there. China is far bigger than America. It's far bigger even than, than America, Europe and the whole of the, the Arab states. We need to come to terms with China and we need to come to peaceful terms with China. These are not monstrous people. These are people that are coming out of a long phase, a difficult phase in their history when they had a lot of repression and they still have a long way to go before they come up to our standards of human rights. But you only have to look in Spain to see that the standards of our human rights are already slipping back to the times of the Spanish Inquisition. So we cannot take the moral high ground here with China. As far as I'm concerned, China would be a fantastic trading partner for Scotland. They have already increased the, the stuff that they import from Scotland by 40% in the last year. And that's an indication of just how seriously the Chinese take the Scottish economy. Companies like um, 
like this new sports car company like Raptor, they'll be able to export cars to China, remember. And China is a far bigger market even than Europe. 800 million people in China. It might even be more than that now. And not only that, the Chinese diaspora, the Chinese communities all over the world. So we can't ignore this anymore and we can't demonize the Chinese. They're, they're too far away for them to be a threat to Europe. So the Russians are, are the latest target. Anyway, I've waffled on long enough about this, but the point is Russia is not the enemy here. The enemy is the economic collapse of the Western capitalist system. It's running out of steam. It ran out of steam in 2008. That was one of the last death throes of it. And now we're limping along. The British economy is stagnant completely. As soon as Brexit happens and Scotland leaves, the rest of the British economy will collapse anyway because the oil is the only thing that's keeping it afloat. Once the oil goes, uh, and once Scotland is free from this parasite which has been sucking the oil money out of it for all these years, Scotland will fly because it has immense wealth. And it's just a case of how we manage it, and what we do with it, and how we invest it that's important. And having a good investment partner over a long period of time is important. And the Chinese, unlike the West, do not work on a four-year electoral cycle. They work on much longer time scales, maybe 50, 60 years ahead they're looking. And they can see that they need to reduce their environmental impact dramatically. They need to get climate control. Uh, they need to get climate control. They need to get control over the weather back to prevent this runaway climate change that's happening at the moment. They can see it. They have terrible pollution problems and they're looking for green solutions. And Scotland is one of the best places to provide that kind of help. Okay, <clears throat> enough of this. Time to go. But think of what I've, I've talked about today. These former Eastern Bloc countries, the Korea, China, Russia, are not the enemy. These are our future trading partners. The West economy is in the bin, and it's going to stay that way now. We need to think ahead, and we need to think about trading with people who have more to invest and a longer term, uh, the longer term future of the planet in their plans. That's all I would say. I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye for now.